There have been worries about inflation uh, coming back on the back of Trump's tariffs. And uh, Donald Trump, president-elect, has now doubled down on tariffs, especially on BRICS countries. We'll talk about why. And uh, the outlook for inflation, Fed policy, and the Trump trade. Joining us today is Jason Trenard. He is the CEO of Strategas. We'll talk about his portfolio allocation strategies and his outlook on markets. Welcome to the show, Jason. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Jason, let's start by talking about some recent economic data. As you know, PCE data came out last week. Uh, Core PCE is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. Core PCE came in at 2.8%, a little bit higher than the previous reading. Headline PCE was 2.3%. Both numbers came in more or less in line with consensus expectations. Did it meet your expectations? They uh, they did, although I do think it, if you look at more broadly the data last week, and I, I'm, I have to say I'm not a particularly big fan of Supercore, uh, but Supercore, I believe, came in at 3.5% uh, on, on the uh, PCE. And so my own opinion is that the, the easy progress uh, on inflation has largely been made. And I have to say we're more worried – uh, hear about a second wave of inflation, perhaps in 2026. And that, that would be, frankly, without the tariffs. Uh, there, there are a number of, whether it's historical precedent, whether it's pent-up demand for wages, whether it's deglobalization, uh, immigration, all of those things, in my opinion, could pave the way for, for higher inflation. Tariffs, of course, might not help, um, but um, there, there's plenty of raw material for, for another wave of inflation without uh, without tariffs. And I think the key, frankly, for the new administration will be to, in my opinion, stop deficit spending or, or slow down meaningfully deficit spending that we've been so, uh, <laughs> so, so enthusiastically participating in over the last several years. Do you think they'll be successful stopping deficit spending? That is on the agenda. They've talked about it. They've talked about making the government more efficient, among other things. Yeah, it is on the agenda. I mean, I don't think, listen, you're Right now, we're running budget deficits are of a, a little less than 7% of GDP, uh, which we've never done before when we either weren't in recession or, uh, or at war. Uh, so it's pretty far out there. Uh, stopping deficit spending is tough. Getting deficit spending to something more reasonable, like the 3 to 4% range, in my opinion, is, is quite possible. And, and that could simply just be by, uh, by doing things a bit differently. Um, I, I don't know if I'm as enthusiastic about getting $2 trillion out of the budget, uh, perhaps as some others are, but there's, there's certainly plenty, uh, plenty to cut. You'll get some basic, uh, just improvements, even just by stopping student loan forgiveness, uh, employee retention tax credit, other, uh, other pandemic related spending that's still, uh, that's still out there. And so that'll help. Uh, and then I think if we do things a bit more efficient, efficiently, it it's a change. And I would say among my clients or institutional investors around the world, Americans are very excited about the potential for having some sort of fiscal um, reform. I would say uh, clients outside the United States are excited, also a little worried, uh, just because um, there is a chance the dollar strengthens very, very meaningfully uh, on, on that. And so if you're managing international money, it could be a little bit of a headwind. Okay, take a look at my screen here. I'm going to read you an article from Fortune. This is documenting Deutsche Bank's views on monetary policy. Deutsche Bank warns Trump tariffs could stop Powell from cutting Fed rates at all next year. Analysts at firms like Deutsche Bank warn that incoming Trump era policies such as inflationary tariffs, I think that's um, we'll talk about that assumption, could stall further rate reductions. There's two things. One is just the details of the underlying economy that we see now, which is the consumer has remained resilient. The labor market looks more resilient and more stable than what we thought. And inflation has been higher over the last several months. We will talk about your outlook on inflation and um, how you how you define inflation for your terms. But uh, first, let's address some of these banks' outlooks. Do you think that the Fed could stall rate reductions next year? I think, frankly, the Fed, without without even discussing tariffs, my own opinion is that the Fed should slow down on on its easing campaign. Personally, I didn't I didn't think the fifty basis point cut in September was really justified, um, just because again some of the easy gains on inflation have been made. Uh, but it's, now it's going to get a lot tougher, especially if your if your goal truly is two percent. And I have my doubts that the the, the real goal is two percent on the Fed. But if if that's your goal, uh, uh, it would strike me that you want to be careful 
uh, for a lot of the reasons I mentioned before about easing uh, too quickly. Historically, when we've looked at waves of inflation, what we found is that about 90% of the time, you have one wave of inflation over 6%, uh, you get a second wave of inflation. Uh, and that's largely because in the first wave, workers tend to fall behind so quickly that their wages don't have time to catch up. Uh, as time goes on, you've seen this with Boeing, you've seen this with the Longshoremen's uh, Union here in the United States. As time goes on, uh, unions and workers demand not only higher wages, but also uh, higher wages to make up for what they have missed in the last several years. And that's why I think you're seeing, let's say in the Longshoremen's Union, I believe it was 62% over six years. Um, Boeing machinists, I believe it's 38% over four years. That is not really consistent with 2% inflation. But, but part of that is to make up for the fact that their standard of living has declined over the last several years. So I, I think, you know, the tariffs, I know that's it's kind of a boogeyman out there. I, I understand where President Trump is, is coming from uh, mm-hmm. in doing this. I, I think I think in many ways it's justified, or at least the threat of tariffs is justified. Uh, but um, there are inflationary issues uh, uh, apart from tariffs uh, that I think the Fed should be concerned about. Well, let's address some of these inflationary issues. So here we have Stratika's is common man CPI versus wages. Uh, in the blue line, you have the common man CPI, food, energy, shelter, clothing, utilities, and insurance. Uh, that's outpaced wages. This is interesting because if you look at, I'll just Google this real quick, the St. Louis Fed uh, real wages, you can see that real wages have actually been rising as of late if you just look at the last five years so how, how did you calculate this what's different here yeah well i think i i'm not sure we're using the employment cost index and i think the the real wages may have started to pick up just recently mm-hmm. <clears throat> but i think if you look at inflation cumulatively which is the way <clears throat> most normal people look at at them um if you just use the cpi and you use the eci it would show the same thing not to been necessarily the same magnitude, but the fact is the prices have risen a lot faster than than wages. Uh, and employment cost index actually a pretty expansive view of wages because it includes benefits. So um, if you looked at just wages, the, the the real wages would actually be further behind uh, than they are. But the idea is that um, for most average people that don't own stocks, about forty percent of Americans don't own financial assets. Uh, inflation is not necessarily, you know, trips to Barbados or a flat panel television screen. Yeah. It's food, it's energy, it's shelter, children's clothing, utilities, insurance, things that people must buy every day, every week, every month. And in my opinion, this, this it not only explains, I, I think, some of the, cha- the differences in spending habits among Americans, but in my opinion, it also explains why uh, the Biden and Harris campaigns did not get more credit for the economy, despite the fact that the, the headline numbers looked pretty good, right? Inflation came down, stock prices were high, the unemployment rate was low, and yet there was a sense of unease in the economy. And I think the unease was largely among, again, the average person who we call the common man, you know, as uh, from, from Aaron Copeland's fanfare for the common man. Yeah. Uh, that's the idea. But that, that, in my opinion, is what's been been going on here, and and I think um, it's one of the reasons why people feel uneasy. Okay, uh, that aside, though, the Fed doesn't look at this particular measure. Um, no, that, not to our knowledge. Yeah. Uh, so, basically, what are they going to do with this information that we've just discussed? <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, I mean, I think um, I I think one of the listen, I I have great respect for the Fed. Yes. Um, I, and what they're trying to do, but by the same token, I I do think. Um, uh, it, it runs the risk, at least recently, of being overly academic. And uh, it might be well served to spend a little bit more time. I know there are regional feds, uh, re- regional fed banks out there uh, that try to do this, but um, it might be better served to just try to um, spend a little less time doing econometric modeling and a little more time just talking to regular people. Uh, and uh, it couldn't hurt. I don't think it could hurt. Uh, there, there are plenty of models out there. Uh, but uh, it, a lot of the insights, I've been doing this for over 30 years. Yeah, A lot of the insights I get are on the economy and the markets generally come from 
the fact that we have clients in 45 states and we, we regularly visit them. Mm-hmm. And so um, maybe a, a little bit more practical, you know, kind of shoe leather approach wouldn't be the worst idea. Could one make the argument, Jason, though, that yes, a lower interest rate where Fed funds rate may be inflationary or more inflationary than a higher one, but it could also stimulate growth. It could also make loans cheaper could. for the average, the common man. It could also put more discretionary income back in their pockets if their car payments or whatnot are a bit lower. That could that could make people's lives a little bit easier. It could also, if employers were so inclined, boost wages a little bit more if their cost of borrowing, the cost of capital is a little bit lower. Yep, that's that's always the push and pull, right? There's yeah. always there's there's no there's no uh, in economics there's no easy answers, right? It's always a cost benefit analysis. I would say though, if you look at mortgage rates, mortgage rates have backed up about fifty basis points since the Fed first eased. Um, so if the if the goal was to get uh, borrowing costs lower, right, um, Fed easing really has not achieve that, it's actually gone uh, the other way. The, the greatest uh, tax, really, especially for um, people without a lot of financial assets, of course, is inflation. And, and so, um, in my opinion, uh, over the longer term, the average person is best served by having price stability uh, more than anything else. So I understand the impulse, uh, but I also uh, believe that price stability um, it used to be the only mandate that changed in the late 70s, but I, I, I still think it should be the primary mandate uh, for the Fed. I think everyone tends to benefit, um, both rich and poor, uh, by having stable prices. Going back to the Deutsche Bank article I read, they they use the term inflationary Trump tariffs. Do you agree that tariffs are, in this particular case, inflationary? It depends. Uh, it really depends on whether the tariffs are um broadly applied to everything, to both goods that are produced in the U.S. Uh, and goods not produced in the U.S. But if, if they're applied only to goods that are not produced in the U.S., uh, that isn't necessarily inflationary because consumers would choose the cheaper option of the domestically, uh, of the domestically produced product. Now, again, what I believe in free markets, um, but I also believe that there should be reciprocity in trade. And I believe the Trump movement largely is that really captures this idea uh, that the U.S. consumer has largely been subsidizing the rest of the world for many, many years, um, the rest of the world's economies. Uh, the exchange really was for peace. Uh, and that made a lot of sense, I think, for a long period of time. I think a big turning point was when China joined the WTO. Uh, and in my opinion, at that point, what you saw is a, a very, very rapid deterioration in the standard of living for many Americans, especially many Americans in the middle part of the country that were doing uh, more manufacturing work, uh, less service-oriented work. And I think that's part of the political phenomenon that is that is Donald Trump. And so I support that idea. I support the idea that there should be more reciprocity in trade, um, especially when we have $36 trillion in debt. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's, it's fair to assume that uh, the the burdens should be should be shared more equally. The economic burden should be shared more equally. Take a look at this post that um, Trump made on Truth Social last weekend. The idea that the BRICS countries are trying to move away from the dollar while while we stand by and watch is over. We require commitment from these countries that they will neither create a new BRICS currency nor back away back any other currency to replace the mighty U.S. dollar, or they will face a 100% tariff and should expect to say goodbye to selling into the wonderful U.S. economy. They can go find another sucker. There is no chance that the (laughs) BRICS will replace the U.S. dollar in international trade, and any country that tries should wave goodbye to America. Well, look, he's already amped up tariffs on China, Canada, and Mexico last week. Now he's threatening 100% tariffs. On BRICS, right. India is in there, Russia is in there, China is already in there, but now it's basically he's threatening 100% tariffs. I mean, China never really, I don't think, expressed any interest in, in forming a BRICS currency, but I'll, I'll let you address this and whether or not this this threat has any substance whatsoever. Well, listen, I think, of course, yeah, 
President Trump hasn't done anything yet because he's not in office. Uh, sure. But you are seeing that the threat of tariffs it is uh, it's clearly changing behavior um, outside the United States. Um, and so you saw that Justin Trudeau was Mar-a-Lago, I believe, on Friday night. Uh, and uh, the new president of Mexico obviously is is changing uh, some of her policies with regard to immigration. Um, I frankly, I, I don't as far as the BRICS are concerned, especially if if President Trump um, is true to his word about government efficiency. And I have every belief that he is, especially with the Vek Ramaswamy and Elon, and Elon Musk there. Uh, you won't have to worry about any other currency. Uh, the U.S. is a reserve currency. There's nothing that will change that, in my, in my opinion, um, in my lifetime. Uh, and I'm 56, so you know, I think we got another 30 years or something. I, I don't see if we continue down this path, um, which is spending more money that we than we don't uh, spending more money than we have, we will eventually re- uh, lose the reserve currency. But we're not at risk of doing that now, and we're especially not at risk of that happening if we actually get some control of our own spending and we start to make some better economic decisions. Um, so I can see I can see President Trump's uh, point of view from this, but I, if I were advising him, I would tell him it's nothing to worry about. You do the right things. Uh, the dollar will remain the reserve currency regardless of what these other countries uh, do or, or whatever whatever system they try to, uh, whatever system they try to create for themselves. Okay, so turning now to the uh, implications of um, what we discussed on the markets based on your outlook on inflation, based on your outlook on the Fed and based on your outlook on tariffs, which assets do you think may do well into 2025? Well, listen, I, you know, personally, because I am worried about, uh, I am worried about a second wave of inflation. I am worried about, um, about the fact that we're going to have to make progress on government spending. I I would keep uh, treasury maturities rather short. I, I wouldn't go, uh, too long out on the yield curve uh, here. You've seen a nice rally in the long end of the curve recently, but um, could continue. But uh, I'm not sure I would be a big buyer of 10-year treasury yields above 450. On the equity side, we have a, a very strong bias uh, towards domestic over international and large over small. We have a um, we have three ETFs. Uh, the one that I help manage is called the Strategist Macro Thematic Opportunities Fund. And in that, we have really four, it really, it's a rotation among four themes. Uh, we have four themes now, but we rotate themes in and out depending on what's happening. Yes. The four themes currently are uh, artificial intelligence. The second is uh, industrial, um, I- industrial power generation, which is partly an offshoot of AI, just given the, the needs for industrial power that will be driven by artificial intelligence. It's deglobalization. Uh, which we think is going to uh, pick up, um, sadly. Uh, but I do think that deglobalization is is a, is a new theme. Uh, and then lastly, we have companies that we call cash flow aristocrats, companies that generate a ton of cash that will be able to withstand a potential increase in long-term interest rates uh, should that happen. And, and mercifully, that fund has been outperforming the S&P 500 uh, thus far this year by by a wide margin and we we hope that continues cash flow aristocrats so cash flow uh meaning from the company or to the investor they're not dividend aristocrats right right so they 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 can be both but okay. it, it's companies um it's companies that generate a, a ton see. of cash flow um and so they can make their own luck they can use they, they're not dependent upon the kindness of strangers for their own capital uh needs you know one of the things that worries me a little bit about small caps. I know they had a great rally, but a good portion of, let's say, the Russell 2000, yes. um, good portion of the Russell 2000 doesn't earn money. It uh, doesn't generate a lot of cash, more than what is needed to, to make debt payments. So it's hard for them to grow. Uh, companies like Walmart or Kroger or other companies that generate a ton of cash have the wherewithal uh, to, again, either invest in their own companies or uh, return money back to shareholders, and that's where we want to be in this environment. When you when you say that companies need to generate sufficient cash flow, how do you define sufficient cash flow? Um, certain yields, well, it's, certain, yeah. No, it's not, not necessarily a certain yield, but it's you're looking at things where it's it's greatly in excess of what the debt payments are. Okay, and and so um, so it, it's it's a pretty low bar uh, actually, mm-hmm. but you know the greater the cash flow yield, uh, the better. 
uh, of course, uh, but also companies, when we look at that theme in particular, we're looking at companies that have had a proven record uh, of proven record of generating that kind of cash flow. So they're not, uh, it's not just for the moment. It, it's something where this is a part of the culture of, uh, of the firm. We also have um, artificial intelligence names uh, in, in um, that are another theme that generate a ton of cash, but a lot of that cash flow is going to grow their own businesses, right? And so that's a bit different, but it's, it's, a, it's an offshoot. In, in our opinion, the, the use of the return on that cash flow is going to be quite high. Uh, given the build out of uh, artificial intelligence. Well, are you expecting the capital structure of some of the sectors that you follow to change next year, given that interest rates are expected to fall a little bit? Do you expect people to take on more debt? I don't, listen, I'm, I'm a little skeptical, frankly, that, that long term interest rates are going to drop a lot more from where they are okay. today. And that's simply because of just, again, even if nothing changed, even if we had the a Biden, a second Biden um, administration or a Harris administration, um, the amount of issuance of treasuries would increase just naturally based on interest expenses alone. Because not not only have we issued a ton of debt, the thirty six trillion dollars in debt, twenty eight trillion owed to the public, we've unfortunately funded most of that short term. So um, about fifty five percent of our debt matures in the next three years. And as a result, uh, the weighted average cost of our debt is lower than every part of the yield curve now. So, which means that every new, every time we retire debt and issue new debt, the interest expense is higher than it was before. So, interest expense is spiraling higher, uh, which is going to cause issuance to increase and could cause a supply issue longer term. So that's why I think it's it's very very important going back to what we were talking about before with regard to Doge. Or getting some cost savings, it's very, very important, in my in my opinion, for the U.S. government to get its act together and stop spending money it doesn't have. And and it, I will say that is a Republican and Democrat affliction. Uh, and we go we talk about that. I think a lot of that has been made possible by the fact that the Fed has been so willing to expand its balance sheet. Uh, it's removed any sort of sense of consequences uh, for profligate spending uh, for many years, but. Uh, in my opinion, that's not a good long-term approach uh, for the health of the economy. On that note, what is your outlook for the U.S. 10 years? Currently at uh, 4.17, and it was yeah. at f- pretty much 4.5 just a few weeks ago. Yep, and it was you know 13 months ago. If you remember, it hit uh, about 5%, yeah. I believe, on November 1st, 2023. At that point, believe mm-hmm. it or not, also the S&P 500, I believe, hit 4,100 roughly just for a couple of days. The big change that was made at that point was that Secretary Yellen stopped issuing coupon debt and started issuing a lot of short-term debt, a lot of bills. And that resulted in a big rally and a long end of the curve. Um, So, you know, in that sense, it worked, but it it also, you're taking a lot of risk by funding very long-term liabilities with short-term funding. So to answer your question directly, um, I, I, I'm not an aggressive buyer. Of, of, I, would not, I personally wouldn't be an aggressive buyer of 10-year treasury yields at these levels. Uh, my own suspicion, given my views of the potential for a second wave of inflation uh, and perhaps stronger real growth, uh, is that uh, 10-year treasury yields are likely drift higher. I don't see an accident uh, waiting to happen unless we make a policy error. Um, and I don't believe personally the tariffs will be the policy error. Uh, and that's just simply because I know a lot of the, uh, a lot of the people that, um, that consult and, and advise, uh, president Trump, generally speaking, whether it's Larry Kudlow or Steve Moore or Art Laffer, they tend to be free traders, yeah. uh, and they, they understand the benefits of free markets. And so benefits can, uh, tariffs can be used as a tool. Uh, to achieve either economic or political um, um, gains, uh, but I, I I don't foresee uh, President Trump uh, using tariffs to such an extent that we risk a recession or risk um, uh, a big wave of inflation. I, I I interviewed Art Laffer. I'll tell you a joke that he told me. Uh, he uh, Laffer once said to Trump in his first term, uh, President Trump, I don't believe you really. You know, do want to implement all these tariffs? I believe you're a free trader at heart. I mean, look at your wives; they're from, you know, they're imported. So uh, I don't think apparently Trump didn't laugh at that joke. Uh, but I get yeah. the point. <laughs> um, 
Yo, uh, Yellen is not going to be the uh, Secretary of the Treasury anymore. Investors were eagerly awaiting who would take her place. And uh, with Scott Bissett now being appointed, how would you trade uh, Bissett at the helm of the Treasury? His no. 333 policy. Yeah. Would that change your outlook? Would that change your ETF strategy? No. I mean, uh, you know, and I know I, with, in terms of in terms of full disclosure, Scott's a very good friend of ours uh, here at Strategus. Uh-huh. He's been a longtime client um, and a friend. Um, I, I know him quite well, and I think he's uh, an extremely bright, reasonable uh, person uh, that also understands, though, the Trump agenda, uh, both from a political, social, and economic perspective. And so, I think that uh, I think he's a wonderful choice, uh, mainly because he's been in the trenches for so many years. And as a markets person, so I, I, I think at this particular time, it's important to have a markets person in that role, okay, um, as opposed to in the past, a lot of times, secretaries of treasury might come from industry, or they might be a Wall Street person, but not, not necessarily a market person. I think having somebody that understands the, the inner workings of financial markets would be very, very important uh, at this juncture. The second three of us, three, three, three policies, so 3% deficit of G. Deficit, 3% of GDP is his first one. 3% right. GDP growth is the second one. 3 million oils, uh, 3 million barrels of oil a day pumped out. Now, the 3% GDP growth, how is the government going to achieve that, do you think? Well, listen, you, the, the government can do that by getting out of the way. And, and I can tell you, again, just being, just over the last couple of weeks, being traveling quite a bit, um, you're already seeing some of the animal spirits, particularly in corporate America, start to start to bubble up. There, there's excitement about uh, a, an easier regulatory policy that would allow for deal making. I also think just knowing that the outcome of the election and, and knowing that you're going to have a more business friendly administration will probably lead to more capital spending uh, on the part of uh, U.S. companies. So those are things that can greatly help out. Um, certainly, consumer spending is, is already quite strong. Uh, but I also think that um, there is a chance if you get a better balance of trade, you get more investment, uh, it'll offset uh, perhaps lower government spending uh, and uh, consumer still is in extremely good shape. So I, I think it's, I don't think it's beyond the pale uh, at all to get 3% GDP, real GDP growth. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Jason. And on that note, let's end with the final question. We've talked about your portfolio strategy and your ETFs. If you were to name drop one or two asset classes that you think would outperform um, or could be stock sectors, uh, what would they be? Well, listen, I think, um, I will say, I think defense, I think the defense, the U.S. defense industry is um, is a global, I, I think, first of all, I think defense industry in general is a global growth industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's true uh, in the U.S. I also think it's true in, in Europe, Korea, there are other other countries, other areas that have very strong uh, uh, defense companies. I also think, though, that uh, this idea of industrial power, um, that uh, you want to look at companies that are going to be able to provide more electricity. So nuclear power, uh, nuclear power oriented companies like Cameco, others, uh, I think are good places to be. And uh, I would encourage people to take a look at uh, uh, the holdings of SAMT, uh, to uh, to find some of those names in which we're investing. All right, excellent. And where can we find those holdings? Where can we learn more from Stratega? So if you go on Bloomberg, uh, you could uh, you could just put in SAMT, or you can just go to our uh, website, which is strategusetfs.com. Okay, excellent. We'll put the links down below uh, for the website. Thank you very much, Jason. Good to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.